content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. We've been covering the JFK assassination for a few episodes and decided it was time to bring in another voice. The person we turned to was Fred Litwin. He has researched the case for years, and we've been impressed with his work. We'll let him talk about his own background himself in a few minutes, but we wanted to highlight the fact that we became aware of him through his work on Oliver Stone and Stone's movie, JFK. That 1991 film as you may remember, told the story of New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. In the movie, which was of course directed by Oliver Stone, Garrison was portrayed as a noble character by actor Kevin Costner. He's a hero who dared to bring charges against businessman Clay Shaw in the JFK assassination. In reality, Garrison's investigation techniques were shoddy. Shaw was clearly innocent and ended up being fully acquitted. But Shaw's life was devastated by the reckless acts of Garrison. Now Stone is back with a new documentary series on the assassination, and Litwin has written a book about that series called Oliver Stone's Film Flam. In our conversation, we discuss Stone, and we ask Litwin about other matters as well. Is the so-called magic bullet that is in the National Archives actually the bullet recovered on the day of the assassination? What the heck happened to JFK's brain? We'll get Litwin's take on those and other issues. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The JFK Assassination, a conversation with Fred Litwin. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, my name is Fred Litwin. I grew up in Montreal, uh, Canada. Um, basically, I ended up uh, in 1983. I took a year off to go traveling around the world. So I came back and ended up with a job in New York City. I worked on Wall Street for a couple of years, and I became uh, vice president of sales for a small software company called Land Systems in New York, um, who were then sold to Intel Corporation, and I worked nine years for Intel in Europe and in Asia, and then I retired uh, in 2000 and moved back to Canada. Uh, but basically, what's interesting is my my interest in the JFK assassination started when I was 18 years old in 1975, um, and I watched the Geraldo Rivera show and saw the Zapruder film, and that started me on a quest to find out what really happened. And of course, like most people, I was a conspiracy guy for many, many years until around 1990, 91, when I started to change and I ultimately became convinced that Oswald was the lone gunman. It's interesting. And since then, I've written three books and uh, Oliver Stone's Film Flam is my latest book. Uh, it's a terrific book that we recommend. 
Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who uh, who this Oliver Stone is and why you decided to write a book about him? Well, Oliver Stone was one of the one of the great directors producers in Hollywood. He made a number of really fantastic films, and in 1991 he came out with his epic film JFK and uh, about the JFK assassination. And unfortunately for that film. His protagonist was based on the career of Jim Garrison, who was the district attorney of New Orleans, who um, reinvestigated the assassination in 1967 to 1971. But in 1967, he indicted a gay man, Clay Shaw, for the for conspiracy to kill Kennedy, and it was all a sham. His whole investigation was a fraud. Uh, he had nothing. It took two years to go to trial. Shaw was acquitted, and then it took uh, he was Garrison went after him for perjury, and that took another two years to get rid of that. And by then, Shaw was a broken man. He eventually died of cancer. It was a <clears throat> that was really really bad. But what made it worse was Oliver Stone decided to to sort of he he re he re victimized Clay Shaw, and that was the real problem. And so, uh, you know, I discussed that in my first book. I wrote a whole book about him, my second book, um, called On the Trail of Delusion, Jim Garrison, the Great Accuser. And uh, last year in 2021, um, at the end of 2021, Oliver Stone came up with a new documentary series called JFK Destiny Betrayed, four hours documentary, and it's full of conspiracy nonsense. And I spent several months debunking it on my blog. One thing that's interesting to me is I was around back in 91 when the JFK movie came out. I remember it got a lot of publicity. And this documentary you mentioned came out last year, I guess. I didn't even know it existed. So that uh, perhaps there was less of a market for this sort of thing than there used to be. Yeah, it's very interesting. When when, when Oliver Stone finished his new documentary series, of course, he wanted... Well, the whole world has changed now with between films and streaming. You can't Films don't have the quite the reach they used to have where you can have 1,500 theaters showing your film. But Oliver Stone went to Netflix uh, with his new documentary series, and they turned it down. Uh, National Geographic turned it down. And uh, he told the press that the fact checkers weren't pleased with, um, with his documentary series. And ultimately, all he could find was Showtime in the States, and they aired... Um, the two-hour version of his documentary, which he renamed JFK Revisited. And that was it. So he didn't get, he didn't get very much play in the States, no theaters, and a second-tier streamer who, produced, who streamed the two-hour version. And so very few people have seen um, Stone's documentary series. I, I found it, you mentioned that in your book, that he conceded the reason it wasn't on a, p- a platform like Netflix was because of fact checking. Was he basically but, admitting publicly that there are things in the documentary that weren't true? You would think that's what he's admitting. Uh, he's not saying it explicitly, but I think that's what he's admitting. And uh, he sort of obliquely said, well, you know, your normal fact checkers aren't the right people to check this stuff out. You need sort of, I guess, special conspiracy fact checkers. To check it out, and then they would give you the okay. And this is the problem: is the documentary is full of all sorts of stories that just aren't true. Maybe the fact checkers are CIA plants. <laughs> well, of course, yes, you know, and they've been doing that for years. <laughs> uh, another thing you highlight is that you know Oliver Stone used to be this great filmmaker, but in recent years he's had some dalliances with like the Russian press and things like that. Can you discuss that? Yeah, I mean, Oliver Stone you know, used to be able to make great first-run films, and as his career started to decline, um, he decided to make sort of documentaries um, on some of the great dictators around the world, from Fidel Castro to Hugo Chavez. He did a uh, 16-hour interview series with Vladimir Putin, he, he, he did to, uh, he went to Kazakhstan and did a documentary about Nazir Bayov, who was an incredibly horrible dictator. And so he had these dalliances with, with dictators, and that's his sort of new forte. He made a horrible film about Ukraine, 
um, in which he portrayed uh, the Ukrainians as Nazis and the Russians as the good guys. I'm curious, you mentioned um, that you yourself believed in some of the conspiracies early on. I know Kevin believed in some of the conspiracies over early on until he really looked into it. Um, and obviously Oliver Stone has been taken in by this stuff. Uh, do you have any insight on, on what draws people to that and maybe what differentiates people who get out of it versus people who stick with those conspiracy theories? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I believe there was a conspiracy and it was really based on I didn't believe the single bullet theory, which said that one bullet went through Kennedy and Connolly and emerged relatively unscathed. Um, but when I read the, um, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, they had a panel of 16 forensic pathologists. And when you read their forensic pathology report, it was pretty convincing as to um, why this is what really happened and there's actually no issue. Um, the problem here is that too many people read conspiracy books and they don't get out and read primary documents or any sort of uh, rebutting material that's out there. And so they just get into these bubbles where they think these stories are really true um, without realizing that when you look, deeply look into it, it, it they're, they're, they're just nonsense. And unfortunately, Oliver Stone is very prone to believing what other people tell him. So he read Kim Garrison's book back in the late 1980s, and he thought it was a really good book. He loved it. And the same thing for his new documentary series. Um, his screenwriter is James Eugenio, and Oliver Stone really buys into uh, Mr. Eugenio's theories, book, line, and sinker, without realizing that a lot of them are very easy to, to debunk. It's, it's, it's sort of tragic. One thing that uh, Kevin and I recently, um, it was my first time watching stone's jfk film kevin had watched it before yep. but he was looking at it with a more critical eye this time and i noted that when it comes to his portrayal of garrison it's very much this all-american you know family man hero uh he's played by kevin costner obviously very likable actor um and I i'm curious you know one thing the film glossed over, my understanding, is some of Garrison's more dirty laundry as as far as his career and, and things he did in the JFK case and, and otherwise. Um, could you speak to that and maybe how some of Stone's, you know, film kind of almost becomes myth-making around the kind of person Garrison was? Yeah, Jim Garrison was, you know, he was six feet six tall, he had a deep voice, he was very well-read, and he had a very, very good sense of humor. So he was the kind of guy that journalists could interview, and he would do very well um, in interviews. So when he got into power as the district attorney, he really uh, decided to uh, go after all the different people in New Orleans. He uh, went after the judges. He went after the police. He went after the legislature. He went after everybody with a variety of charges. And he, he really found that he could get a lot of headlines with a lot of baseless charges, and he could actually get his way on a variety of issues. And, and he realized that his office had far more power um, than people realized. I'll give you one example of the kind of thing that he would do. He had the power of subpoena. He could subpoena you to go into the grand jury to testify. If you lived in New Orleans, you had to appear. Once you uh, were testifying before the grand jury, you were not allowed a lawyer, and you could not take the Fifth Amendment. And you had to answer his questions, and his favorite ploy was to then charge you with perjury. Once you were charged with perjury, which is a felony, you were not allowed to travel outside of New Orleans unless you got approval of the judge. And you had trouble getting a bank loan. It would affect your employment prospects. And he would push these people for testimony on a variety of other things. And if you were willing to go along, everything was okay. But typically, he would screen you out until the trial would come and then he would drop the charges. And so he realized the threat of bringing people before the grand jury would yield a lot of information and would get a lot of people extremely scared. And so he, he really understood how to use the office of the district attorney to scare people. Um, there's many, many more stories like that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, the, the whitewashing, for lack of a better word, 
that he did of uh, Jim Garrison. Uh, your book, your, your most recent book, does a great job of dissecting some of the lies or misstatements or distortions in the documentary that he did more recently. And I'd like to discuss some of those. Uh, of course, sure. the the commission that President Johnson uh, formed to investigate the assassination was known as the Warren Commission. And a man named Alan Dulles was installed on that commission. Uh, Alan Dulles uh, was the former head of the CIA. And a lot of conspiracy theorists believe that Lyndon Johnson was pressured to put Alan Dulles onto the commission for nefarious purposes to try to hide the CIA's involvement in the assassination of the president. Uh, and that's, some, that's something that uh, Stone repeats in this documentary. Uh, can you speak to that yeah. and to what the truth is? Yeah, so Alan Dulles is one of the boogeymen in the documentary series. Um, and they, they claim that the CIA pressured Johnson or lobbied Johnson to put Dulles on the commission. Um, the true fact is that Robert Kennedy wanted Alan Dulles to go on the Warren Commission. And in, and part of what Stone says is true. He, he, Al Dulles was there to sort of help keep a lid on some of the CIA secrets. Um, but it was the Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, who wanted that. I mean, he wanted the lid to be kept on the assassination attempts. After all, this stuff was, was occurring during the Kennedy administration. So Stone has it half right, but he really misses the fact that um, it was Robbie Kennedy who wanted Dulles on the commission. What kind of things was Bobby Kennedy hoping to keep the lid on? Well, of course, they were trying to assassinate Castro, and they were involved in a whole variety of, of sabotage and, and a whole variety of programs to destabilize the Cuban regime. And, and of course, there was the dalliances of, of the CIA with the mafia. So all of that had to be kept under wraps. That would have really damaged uh, Kennedy and, and uh, both, both Kent Robert and John, the legacy of John Kennedy. So that, that had to be under wraps. Um, and I think Dulles was there to sort of help try to do that. So, yeah, I, I find that fascinating that there is actually a reason beneath the surface for why Dulles was there. But the conspiracy theorists just miss it. Yes. And I think I, I think one of the things that conspiracy theorists miss is that, in fact, there, there, were, there was a cover up after the assassination. The FBI was covering up the fact that they had destroyed a note by Oswald left at the office. Um, the, the CIA was doing their covering up. Every agency was sort of covering their ass and covering up. And maybe perhaps because of all the covering up, it made it look like there was a conspiracy. We always love to cover a good historical mystery on the murder sheet. So it's not a huge shock that our favorite game is all about a 1920s detective, hot on the trail of all sorts of strange happenings. We're talking about June's Journey. It's a free-to-download hidden object game, and it's utterly delightful. You play as June Parker, a sleuth from the 1920s. In each level, you inspect scenes for hidden clues. I play so much that I'm already on Chapter 12. To advance levels, you get to decorate your own personal island estate. I love collecting different features like a beautiful swan pond, a swirling windmill, and a gaggle of old-time reporters. I'm very proud of all of those. Whenever I'm solving mysteries, I get to travel everywhere from Cuba to Paris to Italy to investigate cases involving artistic scandals, blackmail, and murder most foul. One thing that makes June's journey special for me is the lovely artwork underpinning each level. The attention to detail really makes each scene come alive, and the characters are packed with personality. It's really immersive and makes us feel like we've been dropped into an old-fashioned mystery story. I can get a bit antsy whenever I'm stuck waiting in line or on hold during a call. June's Journey is a great respite, a chance to play a fun game and get a mental boost while I'm at it. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, FBI note. That, that uh, I believe, is when Oswald... Uh, he was being followed. He was uh, assigned to an FBI agent named, I believe, James Hostie. Hostie. Yep. 
And he yeah, hosting, yeah. hosty goes and speaks with uh, Oswald's wife, and uh, Oswald doesn't like it. So what happens there? So Oswald was greatly pissed off that Hosty was uh, a couple of times and interviewed Marina Oswald. Marina Oswald had taken down his license plate number and his phone number, and so Oswald went down to the FBI headquarters in Dallas and left a note for Hosty which I guess told him to stop, you know, to stop bothering my wife. There may have been some sort of threat there. And then after the assassination, Hosty's boss, Gordon Shanklin, told him to destroy the note, flush it down the toilet, which he did. And that was kept secret until the mid-1970s. And so the FBI was trying to, I guess, uh, cover up the note, maybe cover up the extent of their surveillance of Oswald, because maybe the implication would be, if you guys had been more on the ball, maybe you would have caught this guy before it happened. Yeah, maybe if they had been on more on the ball. I mean, uh, Hoover actually uh, reprimanded around 17 different agents for their work in the Kennedy assassination, kept that quiet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly, uh, you know, if they had really, if all the agencies had talked to each other and done a little more homework, they they might have uh, been a little more uh, careful about Oswald. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating topic to think about and ponder. Uh, another thing that's addressed in the documentary, of course, is the nature of the wounds. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm interested in the wound to the president's throat. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. it's, it's very important to ascertain whether the wound to the throat is an entrance wound or an exit wound, because Oswald was behind the president. And so if it was an entrance, right. if it's an entrance wound, Oswald can't f- hit him from the front if he's from the behind. And initially, one of the doctors who worked on Kennedy at Parkland Hospital Moments after the assassination, uh, this doctor said that the throat wound was an entrance wound. And later, he changed his mind and said, no, it wasn't. And so some people see something sinister about that. Can you uh, address that topic? Yeah, so Kennedy was wheeled into trauma room one. And uh, you had all these doctors and a couple of nurses in there. And they had to take off his clothes and... And uh, they noticed a small bullet wound in his throat. Um, And Dr. Perry was one of the first doctors there and realized that he had to do a tracheotomy to get Kennedy to to breathe. So you make an incision in the neck and you insert a tube um, down his trachea to let him breathe. Um, Perry didn't even wipe off the blood from the wound. He immediately did the tracheotomy um, and inserted the tube. And so he didn't really spend that much time looking and examining the wound he did notice that it was a small circular wound in the neck. And to him, um, it looked like an entrance wound. But they did not turn Kennedy over. They did not turn, he was on his back, so they did not know that there was a bullet wound in Kennedy's back. So, you know, the reason we have autopsies is that you have to, uh, you have to really examine the evidence to figure out what the wounds are, uh, because hospital physicians are not there to examine wounds. They're there to treat the patient and make sure the patient can live. And so, yeah, Dr. Perry immediately, or, or right after the assassination, thought it was an entrance wound. But once he found out that yeah, there was a wound in the back, he thought, well, it might be either. So there's nothing sinister there. There's no threats. There's no indication that he was pressured to change his opinion, is there? No, he said he wasn't pressured and... and uh, there's really nothing to this, but of course, people really want to believe it was an entrance wound. Of course, if it was an entrance wound, what happened to the bullet? Where did it go? Uh, nobody wants to answer that question because then you'd really have a magic bullet. A bullet that would, would have disappeared. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, speaking of the magic bullet, uh, there was also a, a minor controversy um, among those who believe in conspiracies about the magic bullet itself. There's, a, there's uh, claims that there's some chain of custody issues and that the, the so-called magic bullet that is in the archives is not the actual 
bullet that uh, was fired that day by Oswald. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this is really interesting. So the documentary made a very, very big deal out of the fact that one of the FBI agents, Elmer Todd, his initials were not on the board. As you hand off the board to other people in the chain of custody, you put your initials on the bullet, you etch them in, and his initials were, uh, were not on the bullet. That was a very big part of the documentary. Well, one of my friends, Steve Rowe, who was a very good researcher, uh, wanted to look at some of the pictures of, three, of CE 399, the bullet, and he wanted to see if he could find the initials of Elmer Todd. And he emailed me, he thought he had found them, but I said, look, before you write something up about finding the initials. Um, in 2016, the National Archives, in association with the National Institute of Science and Technology, released ultra-high-res pictures of the fragments and the, and the single bullet. And I said, you have to check these pictures before we know the truth. The problem is that when you want to look at those pictures, they're so big that you have to actually, you have to stitch them together a series of JPEGs, and it was beyond my computer capability. So I hired a consultant to come in to download all these photos, stitch them together. He put them on a terabyte hard drive, and I had them ship that hard drive to my friend Steve, and it took him a day to get the right viewer to even look at these pictures, and immediately he found Elmer Todd's initials. They're right there quite noticeable um, and it actually it really floors me that the makers of this documentary series did not check the ultra high res pictures that were available to them they accepted the word of, cons- of a conspiracy theorist who was examining low res pictures I find that astounding have has anyone who who's made those allegations have they made any kind of response once they've been presented with the evidence that those initials actually are on the bullet. So we posted an article about the initials and the initial response from James Diagenio, who is the screenwriter was, no, 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 you're wrong. I've got eyewitnesses who have been to the archives and they say that the initials are not there. Um, but then one of his own witnesses in his documentary, Dr. David Mantic, looked at our evidence and he actually admitted in an email you guys are right. The initials are there. And when I went to the archives, I looked at the bullet. I didn't even use a magnifying glass. I just looked at the bullet with my eyes um, and say, you guys are right. And since then, uh, James Eugenio has admitted that the uh, Elmer Todd's initials are there, although he's going to send one of his friends to the archives sometime this year to check it out for themselves. Yes, so many of the conspiracy theorists beliefs and positions are are nebulous and it's difficult to nail down the evidence that specifically disproves it. But this is an instance where anybody who has eyes can look at these high-res images and clearly see the initials on them. And we'll put the link to the pictures in our uh, show notes. Another one of the crazier theories you hear out there is that uh, they stole President Kennedy's brain or something mysterious yep. and nefarious happened with JFK's brain as part of the cover-up of what happened. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this, uh, this is another very big part of the documentary series. The, the pictures of JFK brain, JFK's brain basically shows the right hemisphere of his brain was disrupted. That's where the bullet went through. His left hemisphere was completely intact. And that really supports a shot from behind um, exiting the right front, uh, right side of his head. Um, and so this upsets a lot of the conspiracy theorists because if Kennedy was shot from the front, the left hemisphere of his brain would have been you know, severely damaged, and it's not. So they have to make the case that the pictures of the brain um, are somehow illegitimate. Either the pictures are not the right pictures or they substituted a new brain or something, but something's wrong with the pictures. And so they they have three or four different segments, which I've debunked all of them in my book. One is that the weight of Kennedy's brain was too heavy. Um, they weighed Kennedy's brain 
um, after the autopsy. They put it in, for, in formaldehyde. They let it set, and then you weighed it. You weighed 1,500 grams, which is well above a normal size brain. And so, in the in the documentary series, they ask, "How is it possible his brain is is smashed away, and the brain is still heavier than a regular brain?" And of course, the answer is that putting the brain in formaldehyde adds weight. And in fact, uh, many brains are quite heavier than 1,330 grams, which is the average. And so, when you do the math of a brain that was not blown away but was disrupted, so it lost some mass. Um, it gained mass, maybe 20, 25% through the shrews being put in formaldehyde. So it's actually not unusual to have a brain weight of 1,500 grams. And they don't mention any of this in the documentary series. Um, so it's a complete red herring. Uh, one thing that when I, I, I used to believe in conspiracy theories about this case, and one thing that I always found somewhat compelling where there were stories and allegations that what happened in Dallas, it actually, there have been kind of dry runs for it earlier. That There was some sort of a yep. similar plot in Chicago or in Florida, uh, yep. presumably by the same people. Uh, can you talk about that and let us know what the truth is about those stories? Yeah, so the documentary series basically says that there, were a, there, were a, there was a prior plot in Chicago in early November, and then later in November in Tampa. And then in both cities, there was a taxi, similar to Lee Harvey Oswald, who would have been arrested had Kennedy been assassinated. So I, I didn't really know that much about these supposed plots. But when I started to investigate, it really turned out that actually there's no evidence of a plot in either city. In Chicago, which was November 2nd, 1963, the only evidence of a plot comes from one Secret Service agent who had been dismissed from his job, and there's no documentary evidence to back him up in any way, shape, form, or manner. No other agent supports it. There's no document in support of a, of a supposed conspiracy. And I noticed that over the years, this agent, Abraham Bolden, his story has changed. Every time he tells it, he, he changes the story. And so there just isn't any credibility to a plot in Chicago. The same thing for Tampa. The, there's no evidence of a plot at all. Um, of course, there were threats against Kennedy. And the problem here is that the documentary doesn't distinguish between a threat by somebody who might be crazy or deranged, who might have said something, um, and an actual plot. And so there were a couple of threats against Kennedy in Tampa by two people who were basically mentally unhinged and it really amounted to nothing. I'm wondering, you've done so much research on um, the work of Stone when it comes to the JFK case. Um, I, I, I'm, do you, can you draw any conclusions for us on why a successful Hollywood director, I guess, has gone so much off the deep end on this subject? And, you know, I mean, one thing that strikes me is that it seems like a lot of his points with the JFK assassination is that like democracy was subverted um, by a conspiracy, essentially. Uh, but at the same time, he cozies up to strong men who are very anti-democracy around the world. So I'm just I guess I'm 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 curious on your take on the character of a, you know, a filmmaker who kind of seems to be doing both of those things. Right. Well, I think Oliver Stone was sung by criticism of the film JFK in 1991 and 1992. I think he really wanted to talk about Vietnam and the reasons why, why the United States went into Vietnam. And instead of talking about that, he was met with a, a, a whole mass of criticism about single bullets and the brain and, and Oswald and all the minutia of the assassination. And he spent almost all of 1992 defending his use of Jim Garrison and defending all the minutia and not really talking about Vietnam. And he was really stung badly by criticism in 1992. This was his way, I think, of getting back, of going back to all those people and saying, you know what, here it is, here's a documentary. I was right all along. It was a huge conspiracy. It was all about foreign policy. It was all about um, 
uh, the military industrial complex being upset at Kennedy, you know, wanting to withdraw from Vietnam and usher in a new world, of, of a new age of Aquarius uh, with peace and detente. And so I think that's why he did it. He wanted to get back and say, I was right all along. You guys were wrong. And it's unfortunate that he was snookered into this by a whole variety of newer horrible conspiracy theories. Yeah, it's, it's, it certainly sounds, though, when you're, you know, when somebody's coming from the perspective of prove myself right rather than look for the truth, you definitely can kind of get snookered pretty easily. If you had to, st- if you had to, like, I guess, speak to somebody who's currently very much enmeshed in a conspiracy theory around JFK, what would you recommend that they do in order to maybe <clears throat> get some more accurate information on the case? Well, when I first started in this case in 1975, I went to the library in Montreal, and the only book out there were, the only books were conspiracy books, like Mark Lane's Rest of Judgment. Anybody new into this can now go to the library, and there's a whole host of really good non-conspiracy books um, that you should read. Vincent Bugliosi's Reclaiming History, Gerald Posner's Case Closed, um, my book. There's some very, very good books out there, and they'll give you a very, very different perspective on what happened and how conspiracy theorists um, are misleading you. And so I really strongly recommend that people uh, go to the library and get out some of these other books. Uh, and I, I want to stress this was this is a terrific book you did. There's some great research there, and I would recommend it to all of our listeners and we've barely scratched the surface and I've not seen the documentary. I frankly don't intend to. The book is still very useful and very worth reading because it's almost like a catalog of different claims made by conspiracy theorists and then what the truth of those claims are. So it's, it's a terrific job. Uh, We really enjoyed that book. We want to thank Fred for talking with us. You can buy his book, Oliver Stone's Film Flam, at Amazon. And you can find him online at onthetrailofdelusion.com. We'll link to all that in our show notes. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.